right now he's going over to, uh, to Alpha to pick up some XLs for the shuck market. Where our grandfather did it was uh, probably about 30 miles up river. We probably got about 150 acres. It gives us the ability to kind of um, use, use spots sparingly, like use them for a little while, let it go fallow, move to another spot if we need to. Just the biggest part is, you know, you gotta, you gotta stay with your line and when you hook up, you gotta do it. You gotta do it really fast. You put all your weight on one side of your boat, you're gonna be leaning and you know, you hit the right wave, you're gonna get enough water in the boat and it's, it's not gonna be good. This is, this is an ideal morning right here. We got a phone call from our dads. I think he got it from his dad saying that our oyster leases, our family oyster leases were being um, re-upped and did we have any interest in them because our dads were no longer interested in renewing these things. We sort of had just this keen interest on the history of our family as well as after researching it, figuring out all the issues that the Chesapeake had and how this oyster had been lost to the world. It was really a sorry picture. I mean, all the wild oysters had, had pretty much vanished. Our populations were decimated. So it, it wasn't a real like, rah, rah, let's go do this. It was more like, um, you know, there's a, there's a cool opportunity to try and salvage something. So let's dig a little deeper. You know, every kind of hurdle that came up, whether it's, hey, we don't have any money, we don't have any boats, we don't have any know-how of this stuff. We just figured out what we needed to figure out. They arrive here from the hatchery about one millimeter. Um, we can get them a little bit smaller, but one millimeter we found is probably a good size to, um, to start treating them with open water. As they grow, we keep splitting them out because we all want stuff to be in like sizes because when they're like size, they feed evenly. Every Christmas or every, every holiday was always at our grandfather's house and he had this garage or park couple cars that smelled like cigarettes, gasoline. He had these um, brick steps leading into the house. He was always out there chucking in the pine jars and then um, we'd have dinner or whatever, but beforehand or after he would just be passing that around. Then they end up in our paddle wheel out here, which this paddle wheel, if pushed, can do about probably about 20 million oysters um, that will push through here. They'll go in around six to you know, eight millimeters, and we'll run them through here until about 12 millimeters. We have two different ways of looking at things, and so early on, and now too, but especially early on, we would just fight positively and get to a, a third better place that ultimately was a right solution. These half-inch cages will hold our smallest stuff, broadly cast them in here in kind of light densities so that they have room to move around when the current starts to splash over them. It allows them to, to jostle around because what you want to do is you always want to be chipping off that outer bill growth so that you're shaping the oyster so it gets a nice tight round shape and without them spending a whole lot of time growing shell, they're going to grow depth. We're able to do something that challenges us intensely in one of the most bucolic and backwater places on earth and it's you know, that's, that's kind of special to not have to leave home where we grew up to, to be able to do this. And then they go up this conveyor, they go through this, which is a, what we call a singulator. What it is, it's, a, um, it's basically built on the concept of like Archimedes screw, where it, the oyster, this thing rotates in like this and the oysters become single file. This on the Rappahannock oyster farm, there was sediment in the water, um, no subaquatic vegetation whatsoever, just a lot of mud. Now you go out there, it's opaque. And this computer has a camera up in the top of it that will scan each oyster, and we can set a recipe up for six different size grades. Really kind of re-established the, the oyster reef um, concept that was prevalent for centuries here, eons. Um, so it's just, you know, we're able to actually see the impact of what we do. 35 millimeters will come out of here, our 45s here, our 55s here, our 65s, 75s, and then 85s. In so many ways, people have been obviously doing oysters for thousands of years, but in so many ways it's a, at least a new opportunity for America to be doing aquaculture in this way with like this type of animal that's, that's so sustainable. That's, um, and people use that term sustainability all the time and it's just gotten a little tired. 
but that was probably the greatest thing about this business for us is kind of like peeling that onion about oysters and realizing you know how great they are as a as a species and the ecology of it but also as a, as a farming product that that we were growing something that was a, a very efficient protein that was very much needed um, and that was providing this huge ecological service. Seventy-five millimeters, about three inches. That's kind of a market size. So. This is kind of our, our honey shoot, if you will. And then that's pretty much it. That's, you know, that's to market. Once you get to, to shoot five, you've, you've matured to the point where it's time to go to the plate. What do you think your great-grandfather and grandfather was good for business switching up? I know it's hard to imagine what they would, would think of it because everything is so different. Rolling over in his grave. Yeah. He'd probably be down there every day checking on him. <laughs> oh, I did get a wine. You know, the waterman went out in September and it got a little colder each month. I, we'd come home from college in, in December, January, on break and go right out into the freezing. And uh, it, it, was a, it was a challenge. Well, in January, when school, college started back up again, we were ready to go back to school. I'll bet. And study a little bit, because we didn't want to do that for a living. But. Well, and he kind of encouraged you guys yeah. to, to not pursue that, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, only in the 70s when the oysters started dying. Cause I kind of really wanted to, do, to go into business, but uh, you know, there was no no way when the oysters, we had MSX and Dermo and, you know, that last $10,000 worth of oysters that just died. We used to compare farming to oystering. Farmers could get insurance on crops. Oh, that's still the case. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a big issue now. We're not this industry, the way we're doing it, they still don't consider it farming. It's still kind of this lost They've offered like category. a little bit more of the crop insurance. Started with clams and now like a little bit on oysters, but it's developing. People, uh, care about the water now and uh, there's a lot more education, a lot more awareness. We just took everything for granted. It was beautiful then and you know we didn't have the idea that it'd be polluted or whatever. And there used to be a, a slogan on a t-shirt at West Point, Virginia, save the bay, eat a waterman. Our family has been built on this industry that ultimately ended up being destructive to the oyster health. And I think when we came along, we knew far better at that point. And so that's when we knew we had to change it and do it a different way. We couldn't just keep taking from the wild. We had to keep, we had to figure out how to put back. Many more. Many more. <laughs> oysters that we're serving right now, we've got Rappahannocks and Old Salts. The Rappahannocks are right here. This is our Rappahannock farm, so the Rappahannock River. They're more mild, sweet. The Old Salts from Chicoteague, they're going to be more briny, kind of that oceany flavor. They're all the same species, so it's just kind of where they are grown that kind of changes the flavor profile. Mel 
Alpha Airport, and it's kind of the closest location to our uh, farm that's on the eastern shore. the stuff up on the surface you're gonna you're gonna have this more in the public eye right um, so how to do it on a, on a scale um, that is good for the oyster good for the product but also good for the upland landowners and getting everybody on the same page of saying hey you know uh, we want to get this right just as much as you want to get it right because we want to expand this thing and, and put more oysters in the bay Definitely polishing up some. I mean, with a little bit of just a little bit of spray from the you know from when you did the final process. I mean, that's gonna that's gonna clean up well. Yeah, I mean, if you can get them all all like cupping that. up like that, <laughs> being business. So it does look like you know turning these things and agitating them a little bit more, and uh, it's been worth worth it. So. Yeah, definitely. If we can, you know, take pride in what we do and, and make these things uh, look good, so it's more akin to a, to a vineyard than it is uh, someone, you know, some people just don't like to see the stuff in their backyard, right? So um, taking the time to make sure your lines are straight, taking the time to keep your gear in good condition, uh, to paint a good picture for the for the industry um, is important, so that we can, you know as a whole, as the United States really, you know, come together and show that we can do aquaculture on a large scale and, and, and do it well and not have to um, import so much of our seafood. An industry like this, starting like this in a in 2000, you know, 21, where you have a modern sensibility and you know how to build this for a long future. Not like we've built our food systems in the past where it's been more about take. You know, we really have an opportunity with this to, to build it for a long vision, which I think makes us excited about leaving something that's incredibly lasting. Obviously, not just our business, but an industry that's going to keep going for a long time.